You're watching PC Game Zen, and I'm Phil. Today we'll be talking through some of the most unfair moments in PC gaming history. And you know, it reminds Shut me up. of- I'm Kieran, and here are the most unfair moments in PC gaming history. You're leaving the mission area, whines the video game. Why are you doing that? We've made a mission area specifically for this mission, and you're leaving it. But I'm not trying to leave the missionary, you jumped up piece of software. It was you who drew a bunch of invisible lines and then neglected to tell me where they all are. All I was trying to do was swim around the back of this Far Cry outpost to attempt a stealth approach, which is what you have been telling me to do since the tutorial. Now I'm going to have to start again because my front crawl isn't fast enough to stop the game from desynchronizing, or whatever you're calling it these days. <sighs> Alright, deep breaths. At least we don't have it as bad as Battlefield pilots. They're doomed to glimpse the map for two or three seconds at a time before drifting off on the horizon to explode. For those on the ground, it's like a lovely firework, only there's a player inside who's screaming with frustration. At least, I do hope that's not how fireworks normally work. In every multiplayer shooter, there is always one teammate with absolutely no idea what the objective is. In Rainbow Six Siege, that person inevitably picks Fuse, an operator who specializes in collateral damage. You see, Fuse's gadget is a cluster charge that fires several grenades through the wall, floorboard, or window it's placed on. Pair that with a game mode where your team have to carefully extract a hostage, and you've got yourself a recipe for disaster. Here's how it usually goes down. The attacking team scout out the map with drones searching for the hostage, identifying what operators the enemy team are using, and carefully planning how they're going to breach into the room in team chat. Then they spawn. Fuse sprints towards the objective room, pops a cluster charge on the window, and blows the hostage to pieces. Within 10 seconds, the round is over. No kills, no points, and no hiding from the sheer embarrassment of what had just happened. Even if by some divine miracle the hostage survives, you can always count on one of Fuse's other two charges to see the job through. Okay, Lewis, if you'll make three and warm up those tyres, please. We need you to go through all the edge mapping before launch. That's all the edge mapping. Protect those tyres in your opening stint. We're expecting... Oh, you've been hit by three cars in the opening corner and two more in the gravel trap. Box, box, box. You put in all that hard work in qualifying. You fine-tuned the car setup. Then, D's Nut 69 careered into you in the first apex of the opening lap, and it was all over. To make it worse, his strategy of using you to edge himself round the corner worked a treat, and he's on for a podium while you limp on in dead last. Screw online racing games. Seriously. Get in the bin, the lot of Codemasters F1 series seems to bring out the worst offenders in opening lap etiquette, and its notoriously wrong-headed penalty system will often hold you responsible for others' misdemeanors, which is really rubbing salt in the wound. You can expect similar treatment in Project Cars, Assetto Corsa, and pretty much every other game that lets 20 strangers race in a straight line for 5 seconds while battling latency. For a game often touted for its absurd difficulty, Dark Souls is surprisingly fair. That is until you meet Seath the Scaleless. By this point in the game, there are a couple of things you will have come to expect. You'll die lots and it will take you at least 20 attempts to defeat any boss. But that's okay, because when you do die, you can always trot back to the boss arena, collect your dropped souls and try again. But it's like Mum always said, never trust an ancient albino dragon without any scales. The first time you meet Seath is a certain death trap, with literally no way of defeating him. So you'll drop all the souls you've accumulated on the way, no big deal, right? You'll just head back and you've spawned in a prison cell in the middle of nowhere. Once you break out of that cell, you'll just have a horde of giant spellcasting slugs and some sword wielding snakes to deal with. Yep, seems fair. Now all you'll have to do is get 50,000 souls back, make it through three uncharted game areas and the actual non-bullshit Seath fight without dying. Cool. The world was a kind place once. A place where you could raise a family, or even let your guard down for a second. Now it's only us left. The wanderers. The ones who have to fight or die every day of our lives. Just to see the next- Oh good, I've fallen through the game world and lost five hours of progress. 
you can see why humanity diminished so quickly in Fallout 4, DayZ and the like. Crossing a bridge or walking up some stairs ensures your almost certain death. The developers spent all that time building an ominous atmosphere with their lighting and art direction, when all they really needed to create that tension was pay less attention to mesh colliders. Losing progress in a hail of gunfire is a tough enough pill to swallow. Losing it as you watch your character flail haplessly through a universe of greyness is the stuff of broken controllers, and monitors, and desks, and chairs, and windows. Realism. Life simulation. It's all there in the Sims series, isn't it? They started allowing Sims to climb out of swimming pools with no ladders. They brought back toddlers. But still, STILL, a Sim can die because they have a low cooking level. Sure, the smoke alarm, if you remember to put one in, will call the fire services. But what happens when they get there too late? And I do mean when. No matter how many times you may have told your sim to move away from the fire, they no doubt tried playing the hero with their pathetic little fire extinguisher, which they had no idea how to use. It's bad enough losing someone you've worked on, lived for, lived with, and loved for a reasonable amount of time, without recently saving, I might add. But when they're the only sim left, heartbreaking. No one to plead with the Grim Reaper, no one on your lot wanting to bring your ghost back to life, just a burnt to a crisp sim with nothing to show for it but an empty, too big for one sim house. You know what's really unfair? If you enjoyed the video, please leave us a like and subscribe for more content in the future.